Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. And today we're discussing the importance of history education with guests. Beth English, Executive Director of the Organization of American Historians in Indiana. Scott Casper, President of the American Antiquarian Society in Massachusetts. And Grace Leatherman, Executive Director of the National Council of History Education in Ohio. So thank you all for joining us. I am so excited that that we're here together to discuss history, American history. And as we were saying before the show, you know, who would have thought that people would get so incredibly worked up and angered and and um, uh, so so exercised by the the teaching of uh, of history and American history has always been taught in different ways at different eras. So let's talk a little bit about that. Uh, and we can start with the great state of Indiana uh, from your perch as the history, uh, as, the, as the leader of the Organization of American Historians. Why do we teach history? What is history about? So, um, you know, I think, you know, from our perspective at, at OAH, uh, we, we sort of look at the importance of, of history education in a couple of ways. Um, and, you know, the, the first way is studying history is really a, a critical way for us to understand the way um, that change functions over time. Right. And how in, in that light, society, government, um, culture, all of the things that surround us um, today that we live in, live with, came to be. And it really helps us develop a better understanding and a framework for understanding the world in which we live. Um, and, um, you know, so, so when we think about studying history, it, it really, you know, makes us more attuned to um, how we have developed as a society, the progress that we've made as a society, but also the um, shortcomings that we've had um, over, you know, again, over the course of, of an arc of time. Um, recognizing and learning from an imperfect past is, is really critical to that. Uh, and then the second way that we think about history education is um, the, the thinking skills that come along with studying history. And, um, and I'm sure Grayson and um, Scott can, can talk more about this, but this idea of thinking historically is a really critical skill. And it's a particular skill set that's applicable across and necessary um, across all kinds of different disciplines, professions. But it's thinking historically makes us sift through and assess and evaluate evidence to grapple with complexity, to make sense of often conflicting perspectives and interpretations of an event or an experience. Um, it helps us to identify patterns and to understand the breaks in those patterns, right? And so when we think of change over time, that's where that, where, that's where that really sort of comes in. And so, you know, again, when, when, when we talk about history education at OEH, we look at them in these two ways, as a contributor to conversations in a broader society, societal setting, but then also the, the really critical thinking skills that diving deep into um, historical practice um, can, can facilitate. Such a great set of points, Beth. Um, you know, when I when I hear and I often hear this in pol politicians that you get into this hyperbolic thing where we have never been so divided. And I'm thinking, haven't you read about American history? Right. Yes, Scott? We <laughs> <laughs> yes, we have. And if you look at the history of our of our nation, division has been as much a part of that story as consensus has. Obviously, moments like the Civil War are crucial moments, but there have been plenty of other moments when there were deep divisions in American society. So to talk about this as unusual, yes, this is a different moment because, for example, the media that are available to people to air their disagreements and divisions are different from the media that were at different times. And so I think that's part of thinking historically as well, is asking when we hear statements like this is the most X time in American history, using our historical thinking skills to analyze even those statements and evaluate what may be different about this time, but also how what we experience in this time has echoes of what we've seen before and what we can learn from. 
Well, if you just take a look at the at the divisions at the point of the American Revolution, it was a very balanced uh, population with really what it was not a whole bunch of patriots who were against um, uh, British colonial rule. It was it was a very balanced situation. Society was extremely divided. And, uh, you know, just from our founding, um, we we had these these arguments with ourselves. We're, We're continuing those arguments. Uh, Grace, I'd like to I'd like to ask you about something. When I was uh, growing up and I was learning history, it was fairly obvious that everything that was done in the world and in America was done by men. Women were invisible. Right? I mean, you you look at the the roster of people who are uh, covered in every single era of American history, and they're all guys. Now we know that's not true. Right. <laughs> I, we just know that's not true. How do we how do we teach history that is more comprehensive and and um, and honors the, the the contribution of more of us? Absolutely, and uh, certainly uh, we want to learn about our founding fathers. This is the, there's some inc- you've learned about incredible people in your history in school, I'm sure. But I think you're right that we have left many many groups out of the narratives that we tell in history class, and part of that may be why some students don't always engage. Or, Maybe historically people think, oh, students don't engage with history class. And maybe part of that is that if they don't see themselves in the narrative, whether that is girls, whether that is all different communities in the United States. We have so many incredible communities across the United States. And and if students don't see themselves included in the curriculum, they're not going to engage with that. So I think you've identified a, a real problem. So how do we tell all of these different stories. And luckily we have incredible resources and and Beth and Scott and organization, uh, we're plugged in with many of these incredible historians who are, who are helping tell incredible stories. And also not just historians, but there are institutions in all of our communities who are telling, there are small museums that are telling the stories of local towns and local communities. And the thing we need to be doing is making sure that we all have access to those stories. And we're so lucky to live in a moment when we can have access to them. During uh, the pandemic, we served, we served teachers, we served professors, and teachers couldn't take their kids to museums. But all of a sudden, they had access to these incredible virtual field trips. So they could go to a civil rights museum, they could go to um, they could go to a, a community organization somewhere far from their school or even somewhere very close by. We have access to institutions like the Library of Congress with incredible digitized documents that may get us beyond that traditional narrative. Students could be learning, they could be reading a cookbook. They could be looking at a poster that might tell, take them beyond the narrative that I think um, you may have encountered in school. So we do have incredible documents available to us, incredible community organizations, and it's about making those connections so they're accessible to students and to the public. In terms of, of teaching, one of the things that, that I don't quite get is, is that there seems to be a sense that if you, if you teach uh, history in a different way, that there's a disrespect for other groups that are, I, I, don't, quite, I don't quite get that. Um, you know, if we take the, 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 the question of teaching more about uh, women in, in in American history is that disrespecting me as a, a as a guy? Uh, I, I I don't quite get it. How do we create a a history teaching and learning experience that is really rich that helps to inform our our adulthood and uh, allows us to take action that is informed by the past. Um, there's so much data, right? You can almost get this rush of data, and and I'm not interested in every everything. Scott, how, how do we do this? How do we manage it? We've got different age groups. We have different ethnicities. We have different areas of the country, uh, Indiana and and Bos- uh, and and, and uh, a place like Massachusetts are going to have different different interests. How do we do this, Scott? Well, I think we begin by asking whose history are we talking about? Who, who has been part of the American story or the American stories over the past hundreds of years? At the American Antiquarian Society, we're a research library. We collect, preserve, and make accessible 
the, the printed record of what is now the United States, as well as portions of Canada and the Caribbean up until 1900. We encourage people to come use our collections. We have a number of our collections digitized and available for use. And the idea is to tell as many of those stories as possible. I think one of the things you said, Mark, really resonates with me, which is about how people can take action. One of the ways that people are inspired to take action is by learning about people like them in the past who have been part of history and acted in the past. And if all of the people that they're hearing about don't seem at all to be like them, there's less of that impetus for action. So telling that broader range of stories, and I would call it telling the more complete range of stories as, as far as we can, in fact, can be inspiring to people who can see themselves in the past. So listening to communities, listening to parents, listening to your students, Beth, I mean, is that, is that part of what informs the curriculum? It's not like a top-down approach. It's basically, if you, if you take uh, uh, Scott's point, right, you, you kind of are in a dialogue always in terms of shaping what is presented so that it is relevant to the people who are learning. That's right. And I, I think, you know, for, you know, for the organization of American historians, we, you know, we have a, a really kind of big tent approach to who our membership, you know, who are, who constitutes our membership. And we have everyone from uh, K through 12 teachers to um, museum professionals to, um, you know, scholars sitting in, you know, colleges and universities. And so that really puts us in a, in a unique position to be able to um, have those different stakeholders in conversation with one another. So, um, you know, what often happens um, or, you know, historically what has happened is that uh, sort of the expanse of the historical narrative has grown and changed, um, not because of bias or because people have an agenda, but because new sources are constantly being fed into that narrative. And, um, you know, so historical interpretation, when we think about it in this way, it's not, um, it's, it, it's something that um, documentation, the historical record, the types of things that, you know, Scott's library is, is be, you know, is this critical repository for that those things help us critically engage the past in a conversation. And, you know, as more research is done, as more um, sources are um, uncovered, as people start looking in different places for these stories, right? Um, that narrative expands and grows. And so I think what's really critical in this conversation about um, history education is that we really need to um, have have sort of a sort of decenter the conversation in some ways, decentering it from um, but not displacing the history of what traditionally have been dominant groups um, with others and add-ons, but rather kind of decenter that conversation so that it's a more inclusive and shared um, narrative of all of the different constituencies and stakeholders that have created um, that have created a history of a place or a society or a, or a time period. You know, t uh, Tony Figuerello, who is uh, just, uh, you know, an amazing professional and educator, um, uh, a program professional, um, uh, in museums and, and uh, uh, has a real a depth of experience in terms of how people experience knowledge, he makes a really interesting point. He says, you know, they're, they're facts and then they're stories, right? So the facts we can all agree on, the Civil War happened. But if you look at the Civil War stories, those are incredibly uh, diverse and, and multidimensional. How do we get to the point where, first of all, we agree on facts, it would seem to be easier, but is also pretty fraught. And, and that we're telling textured stories that are, the stories are in a sense, there's a little bit of, uh, of a scrum, right? A little bit of a struggle on whose stories get told and, and which stories are significant, Grace. So how do, we, how do we adjudicate amongst those different stories? Because a story that is told by one person Right. If I'm talking about the Civil War and I'm black, I have a history here and an involvement and a personal uh, commitment uh, to to that story 
that if I am a, a new immigrant um, just coming in from, uh, from outside, um, I might have a different take. How do we adjudicate amongst these different stories so that people's stories get told and shared in a way that isn't, isn't dismissive or, or uh, heated or disrespectful? Sure, and we do get asked these questions all the time. And our te our history teachers that we represent, their parents are coming to them with questions: How are you teaching? What are you teaching? And the thing that that I'm I'm happy to share is that is that teachers actually do have a lot of training on how to teach in a way that is respectful of students, how to teach in a way that is age appropriate. And of course, we need to continue to provide that professional support for teachers because this is hard work. This is this is emotional, important work that is at the core of our democracy. So um, teachers are really doing some some incredible work and, and if parents do have questions about those sort of things I do encourage them to talk to these teachers um, what are you teaching how are you teaching how are we doing this in a way that's appropriate for each group um, and there's just incredible work taking place but one of the things is that first of all no matter what we're teaching or which story we're teaching we need to be teaching historical thinking skills uh, we emphasize history's habits of mind at the National Council for history education so we need to first of all make sure that we're giving students and adults the tools to analyze historical documents um, um, so that we, we have a common foundation, some common skill sets, some common practices that we can use when we do analyze a document or an object. And that's also, by the way, those skills translate really well into non-history life when we're called to analyze documents and objects all the time. So teaching that common skill set first is very important. And, and again, using historical documents in the classroom, we talk a lot about classrooms, but of course in museums or in, in your communities and homes, it takes a lot of the, the, the charge out of that because I think when we look at a document, we're really able to analyze it together and, and find, really get a sense of what was actually happening, which I think can really bring down the heat of some of those encounters that I think you may be witnessing. And, and the other thing is it's important for communities to work together on the stories they want to tell. I think communities are, there's so much commitment in a community and they need to analyze what are the stories we want to tell in our communities. And that's why for us, we do programs. We're, we're doing some work coming up, um, working with rural teachers and connecting them with their town museums. And how can they work together to create projects that serve the whole town? It's important to tell those local stories. We're doing some work in Delaware with teachers who've realized that they don't really know the stories of their Guatemalan and Haitian and indigenous populations. So we're doing some work to make sure they can partner both with the story um, local his historians and also community members so community members can share their stories so I, I do know there's just incredible heat out there in the world as we talk about history education but i just want to make sure that that everyone knows that there are also communities who are working together working with these skills working with these historical documents to put together some really innovative history programs well you know it's interesting we just had two polls the first poll was is there a correct version of history or are there multiple versions that are of history that are correct, sometimes in conflict. 80% of the people said that, that there are multiple versions, even if they are in conflict, but there were people who, who felt very strongly that there are there's really a correct version. And then we, we asked the following question, regardless of the previous answer, is it better to teach one standard version of history as a way to bind the nation together? We had a bit of an uptick um, in terms of the, of the response. Let's talk about that, that function of, of history to uh, bind the nation together. Is, is the interest here to tell some sort of a, a shared story that we can all identify with, uh, identify with? Or is the interest to tell different stories that might connect to different people in different ways and not have that sort of one clear through line? Um, Beth, you want to give a give a cut at this really complicated topic? Well, I think, um, you know, I don't think it's an either or question. Uh, you know, I don't see this as an either or question that there is a um, sort of a standard narrative around which um, everyone needs to sort of rally, if you will. Um, and I think this gets to my point about, you know, um, sort of. Um, you know, decentering but not displacing what has been quote unquote traditional history, right? Um, I think we can have that narrative. We can have that common narrative um, with multiple threads. Um, you know, oftentimes, you know, our you know national past is talked about as a rich tapestry, and you know, it's threads in that tapestry, but it does make a single whole narrative. Um, and so, the idea that um, 
you know, that there is an either or that history is either true or it's not. I think we need to get away from some of these either or kinds of setups when we talk about historical narrative, when we talk about what is and isn't good history, when we talk about what's being taught in classrooms. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you know, historians um, always go to the source. They always go to the source. There is um, methodology, there is practice, there is rigor. And at the end of the day, that's what's, that's what's being fed into um, and enriching, um, I think, what people conceptualize. And, and Mark, what you referenced is sort of your, you, the, the historical narrative you were brought up with. Um, it's, it's really an expansion of that versus a displacement of that, I think. So even I could become educated by listening to somebody else. You know, it strikes me through, through your point that maybe the source of the conflict is that we're just not listening to each other. And, and maybe if we just let the other speak, you know how when, you, when you're in a conversation and, and you're talking over each other and you're, you're trying to make your point. Well, maybe we have that going on right now where we're each trying to make our point and not just listening. And if we just listen to somebody else's stories, we might be entertain, educated, and we might uh, create a greater understanding. Right, Scott? I think that's true. I think historically, and I, I agree with Beth on this, I think part of what we do as historians is embrace complexity and encourage others to do the same. That is the story of the American past, whatever that is, singular or plural, is a complex story in which certain kinds of questions have been debated throughout American history. I mean, to, to pick up on, on the question of listening to one another, I think one of the things that's challenging now is that people of a wide variety of backgrounds are participating together in this conversation. Sometimes they're listening to one another, sometimes they're not. And ways like never before, enabled by technology, but also enabled by a different sensibility as to who has voice, right? Absolutely right. And so if you were to look 75 years ago, when many of the school systems in the United States, certainly in the American South, were segregated, when the American historical profession, that is the historians who were um, best known for the work they were doing, were, were predominantly white men, who wasn't being listened to? There were absolutely African-American historians telling stories, doing the work, and in many cases, not being heard. And so what we have now is more people and more stories are being heard. The voices are, in fact, more plentiful than they've ever been. And I think that, too, causes conflict because we are now hearing and listening to stories. I hope we would listen to stories that might not have gotten the broad airing 75 or 100 years ago that they can get now. We've got two questions, and, and you're the group to answer them. Uh, first, uh, Ken asked about, um, uh, is there hope for uh, a history major and, and uh, someone who is on that his, history track? And full disclosure, I don't want to hide my conflict of interest here. I, one of my majors was, was history, so <laughs> I, I, I confess they're, they're, I, I'm totally compromised in, in this. But uh, Ken asked about, about whether there's hope for, for history majors, and it would, it would be great to get your, your uh, take on that. But there's another uh, question that was asked by Ella, Ella Baff. Um, uh, do you believe that people are becoming more in interested in history um, as, as we go forward? Sort of uh, tagging on to your, uh, your point, Scott. Uh, Grace, you want to you, you try and... Uh, Give a give a cut at at, at uh, helping Ken um, through his question about uh, about whether there's hope and also whether whether there might be more interest in history going forward or less. Yes, I think I, I I took this job two years ago. I've always been in history education, but this particular role, and I have noticed that it, there's really been a shift in the way people react to my job um, because. Sometimes we just think of history. Oh, that's something I, I, I think it's fun to read the books. It's, and it's you're entertaining. You're making a profession out of, out of history, right? So right. it's yeah. work for you, right? Well, I think, I think what we're seeing, 
excuse me, as a nation, is I think we are, in fact, all waking up to the fact that history is, in fact, critical to our democracy. Um, these stories do matter. The way that we analyze these documents, the way that we tell these stories really does matter. So uh, and sometimes that does make my work a little heated, as I said, but I, I think that, yes, this is a particularly important time to be involved in history. It's an important time to be teaching history. It's an important time for communities to be participating in telling stories and doing research and engaging with documents. So yes, um, there, there is absolutely hope. Uh, and yes, uh, we are seeing more interest. Absolutely. I mean, we keep thinking, oh, it's the pandemic. People are going to stop caring. But no, I mean, th this really is a moment when when people are struggling with what are the stories we tell and how do we tell them? So, no, I, I think this is a um, a moment where I'm, I'm very proud to be working in, in history. I think what we're doing is is so crucial. Um, and I, I did also just want to just related to your other questions, just to throw in there. I, I'm sensing that there's maybe some worry that oh my gosh, we're telling so many stories right now, how will we fit them all? Um, and I just wanted to say that one of the important reasons that we engage with history is that we're learning to ask questions. And so I think while I agree that maybe we can't all even learn all these all these stories, what we can do is learn to ask the important questions as a society. Um, we're involved in the Educating for American Democracy framework and they teach us to ask these questions, like how do we simultaneously teach the value and danger of compromise for a free, diverse and self-governing people? It's asking the questions. that's the important thing, not being able to absorb all the facts. So we're just we think it's so important and we're so pleased the rest of the country is really engaging with that as well. Well, documentaries, biographies, Netflix um, uh, 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 productions that that take historical reference and place them into a, the context of a Western or a drama, or or even the um, the, the this uh, the, these recent events surrounding um, the the uh, the royal family in Great Britain or whatever. This is all history, right, Beth? I mean, we we are actually seeing a manifestation of increased interest and also a diversity of roots that historians can pursue as career options as well, going into things like entertainment and, and filmmaking and so on. Yeah, I think that's right. You know, and these are all sort of gateways, you know, um, you know, popular culture can be gateways into interest into um, sort of the, the, the hard nitty gritty of, of history. And, you know, so um, it is a really interesting time. And I think that I think that you are right to, to an extent that, you know, more and more and more people are interested in quote unquote history, you know, I, you know, and that's a very catch all kind of broad term. Um, you know, having said that, I think, too, that, you know, I really loved what Grace was talking about when she was bringing up the sort of community partnerships that they're working on building. And this is to, you know, to me and I think to our organization, it's it's very critical that, um, you know, some of the deepest repositories of history are untapped and those are in communities. Those aren't written documents that are sitting in a library somewhere necessarily, they're oral histories, they're buildings that are still there that no one really kind of knows what they used to be used for, they're um, spaces, it's memory. And all of that helps enrich our understanding of the past um, on community levels for individuals. Um, and also, you know, in, in, in men, in, in much, much, much broader ways. Um, so, you know, I think when, you know, when we talk about the, the, the sort of, you know, segue into history, I think every historian has a story about what got them hooked, right, on, on history and why it is that they build a career around this. Um, and, and to the, you know, to the question of, do I have a, do I have a future as a history major? Of course you have a future as a history major. I'm never going to say you don't. I think you absolutely do. And there are so many pathways, um, you know, whether it's in academe, whether it's in public history settings, whether it's in, um, civil, civil society work. Um, but also again, getting back to that, you know, that initial question of why is it so important to study history is because it equips us with essential critical thinking skills. And those skills, you might be a history major, but you can translate them across a wide variety of, um, you know, of professions, of, of disciplines. 
And it just makes you equipped to be a good citizen, a, a great, um, you know, a sort of investigator of whatever it is that you, you know, that you're working on in your position to evaluate evidence. All those things we talked about, that's not history's space alone. It's, it's so broad and so important and, um, you know, and so critical. Well, in many respects, what you're saying is that everything is history. We're coming to the end of our time. And I'm going to go around the room one more time. I'm going to end up uh, with you, Beth, uh, again. But um, Kathleen uh, Veloso uh, asked a phenomenal question. It's so important. We were talking about it before the show. Um, she said, how do we address uh, those parents who believe that students are being taught information that elevates one group above another? Um, I, had a, I had a discussion that I shared with you of somebody who felt that that the way people talk about history is disrespectful to other people and almost it, 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 it's, it's a trigger. Um, how do we do that? How do we ensure that, that we're, we're not talking down to, to people, um, that, that there's respect, that, that there is a, kind of a, um, an empathetic element here uh, because we really want to bring everyone along. We want to have, have different stories told. How do you deal with parents who think that, that their, their kids are taught in a way that elevates one group uh, uh, above another? Scott, how do we deal with that? I think we start with sources and documents. By, by introducing voices of many different groups through many different sources, I think that's a way to create a kind of his sense of historical empathy and historical connection. It's not that we are elevating one group or over another. It's that we are attempting to recognize the variety of people and groups that have been involved in the American past to the extent that some people feel as though that is pushing other stories aside. It may be worth asking whether those other stories had pushed out the experience of, of groups that we are now trying to, to include in the story. So it really is about bringing people together to explain why we do what we do. And part, part of the role, I think, of, of our organizations as historical organizations and of historians is to make clear what we do. Our role is not to take sides in political debate. It is to inform people in all areas of America about the thinking skills that are important to understanding the past, the kinds of documents and sources that can help us understand. And we're always expanding because sort new sources come to light or people are heard from who hadn't been listened to before. And that is very much about the communities that Beth was talking about and that Grace was talking about. So I think a big part of it is encouraging people to understand it's not about pushing somebody aside. It's about hearing as many of those stories as we can and how they connect to one another because people are in this together. I think it's a very important point that it's not about pushing someone aside. It's about listening and about exploration. Um, uh, uh, Grace, um, before, before you give your answer, we, we talked about the fact that there are huge controversies related to teaching history and, and we asked if people were to pick one answer, is the controversy mostly about, and it's interesting, 54% uh, of people said it's mostly about politics. Politics is about power. Are, are, are we engaged in, in a power struggle when we should be engaged in, in sharing? Um, are we engaged in conflict where we should be engaged in uh, collaborative uh, collaborations and communications. Are we just basically, have we lost our way where, where we make everything into, into conflict and we, we really don't need to? I do think that we are at a moment that is, that is politically inflamed in our country. And I do think that that um, spills over into things that it, it does spill over those intense feelings. This is a, a difficult moment as a nation. And I do think that, that that really does raise the temperature on a lot of the discussions we're having. And again, that's why I think it's so important 
for everyone to take a step back and see what are what are we actually teaching in our communities and how are we doing that? Um, and I really do think that that many parents will, will just be so pleased to see the work that is happening. And there is so much opportunity to bring communities together, working together on asking these hard questions. Again, a lot of what we do in history is teaching those thinking skills. And I, I do think that that's something that folks across the spectrum can agree on, that we, we really need to be teaching these skills. We need to be analyzing documents. Those are skills that transfer, as Beth was saying, that transfer into the real world, into all kinds of professions. Um, and I, I really think there's also a vast agreement that we want to tell all kinds of different stories. I, I truly think people believe that and want that and that sometimes the the intense feelings that are happening in other areas of life can can spill over and have um, so i would just encourage everyone to to take a step back to talk to your teachers to talk to your museums and and to learn about some of those stories yourselves and to if you have i'm a mom if you have kids uh, investigate stories together look at historical documents together because there's so much we can do when we learn to ask questions together and to do analysis together as communities and Beth, I'll give you the last word. What do you think we should do to take down the heat and, and uh, help our historians do their work in a, in a more uh, effective way? Yeah, I think um, I think Grace's point is is really well taken that, um, you know, that history has become kind of a, a, a flashpoint in broader like it's sort of the thing around which broader political struggles are being played out. Um, and um, when you actually look at what's being taught in the nation's classrooms and you actually ask what parents want their children to be taught. Um, polling has showed that a, a broad and bipartisan majority of parents want an inclusive, um, rich, um, you know, uh, sometimes fraught um, narrative to be taught to their children. Um, and um, I, I do just want to quickly give a shout out to um, an or, a, a coalition that um, OAH and, and a number of our other colleagues um, have have um, participate or are participating in. It's called the Learn From History Coalition. And their goals are really very straightforward. It's to educate parents and the public about what is actually being taught in schools. And I think if that information can get out in a meaningful way, um, if the focus is facilitating broad-based discussion versus um, trying to score political points around these kind of flashpoint topics that they have become um, in, in the broader dialogue in society, um, I think that we will be in a, in a much better space um, as not just as a society, but for our you know, community of learners, our teachers, our historians, um, really anyone that's, that's invested in this shared story um, of, of our past. I couldn't agree more. History should not be about power. It should be, that's propaganda. Um, history should be about analysis. History should be about sharing. History should be about dialogue. And maybe one of the things that we need to do is do what my, my wife admonishes me and my family and my friends admonish me, listen a little bit more and interrupt a little bit less. Thank you so much for your wisdom. Thank you for sharing the experiences that you, your boards, your constituents have. And, and please thank them for their great work. Beth English, Executive Director of the Organization of American Historians in Indiana, Scott Casper, President of the American Antiquitarian uh, Society in, in, in Massachusetts, Grace Leatherman, Executive Director of the National Council of, for History Education in Ohio. You've just been so wonderful in educating us all, and particularly I am grateful in your help in educating me. Thank you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Mark. You. Bye. Thank you for having me.